Thank you. I'm really honored to be here today, and what a, a great introduction. Um, so I hope you're not going to be disappointed. Um, no, we haven't landed on Mars. No, I'm not going to talk about Martian healthcare. We did, although Elon Musk has promised that we're going to colonize uh, Mars, and, and NASA is planning to go there, we haven't done it yet, but we're going to do it very soon. What I want to talk to you today about is how what we're learning about the space program and how to provide healthcare in space is really going to impact and is impacting healthcare here on Earth. So for those of you who did watch the Astros game yesterday and stayed up late celebrating the win, yay, um, I'm going to make it real easy for you. Uh, here are the three main take-home messages from my talk today. Number one, astronauts are people too. They're just like you and me and they get sick. Number two, going to space, particularly deep space, away from the protection of our atmosphere, is really bad for your health. And the changes that we see in humans going to space are very much like accelerated aging. So a lot of the problems that we see as we age here today and a lot of the diseases that we, that we develop are very similar to what astronauts get, but a lot faster in space. So while we study those, we can actually help healthcare and disease um, uh, mitigation here on Earth as well. And the third point is that by learning how to give healthcare in a tin can hurling all the way to Mars, we're actually making huge advances in the way we provide healthcare here on Earth. And I'm gonna give you just a few examples. So that's basically the gist of my talk. Those of you who party too late can go to sleep now. So, <laughs> Let's see if I can get this. So unfortunately, when people here on Earth engage with the healthcare system, what they're actually engaging with is what we call sick care. They're really not engaging in healthcare. They're sick by the time they get to a medical clinic. And at that point, a lot of the damage has been done. And the outcomes tend to be worse when you're going to the emergency room instead of preventing things ahead of time. And that comes also with not only bad outcomes, but very large costs in having to deal with a, with a disease that's progressed. So what if instead I tell you that what we were thinking about is developing a future healthcare system where just like the facial recognition, what Panos was just talking about, we have the ability to monitor you, to track you, to make sure that you're staying healthy. And if you stayed up too late, you're gonna get that nap the next day. And if, for example, you um, imbibed in, in too much greasy foods and that's really bad for your arte arteries, you're going to be uh, told by your favorite AI, your artificial intelligence, whether it's Siri or Amazon, it's going to tell you, hey, have some vegetables this week. I think your, your diet's a little off. Or your temperature is a little high. Maybe you have an infection. You need to go get checked out or your heart rate is too high, or if you have breathing problems, it's going to be able to tell when you're breathing really um, fast. It's also uh, going to be monitoring your voice, your stress levels. Maybe you're watching too much news. Maybe you're really stressed out, and you all heard how much stress can affect cancer diagnoses and therapies. So it is a brave new world that we're moving into where we're trying to prevent diseases and keep you healthy. So that's what we're going to have to do in space, because we're going to be sending four people, probably, two men, two women, and we're going to be putting them in a tin can that's going to hurl very far away from Earth, 34 million miles away. And those individuals, most likely there'll be one doctor, and she's likely to be the one to get sick. But the others will be geologists and scientists and engineers who really have not gone to medical school and cannot perform Healthcare, particularly so far away from Earth. So we're going to have to enable regular people. And astronauts, although they're really smart people and they work very hard, they're regular people just like you and me. So we're going to have to enable these people far away from Earth to do all the healthcare that we take for granted here today. So what this means is that they're going to have to do self-care. They're going to have to monitor themselves. There will be environmental monitors that will track the humidity in the spacecraft, the temperature, it will it'll track the air quality, um, it'll track the radiation that's coming in and affecting them in space. But there'll also be monitors on the astronauts themselves, and I'll tell you about some of those technologies. And so that self-care, which they're going to have to do, will also take into account their genetic profile, their family history, what medications are they on, 
How much did they eat? How much did they sleep? How much did they exercise? How much did they move around? What is their mood like? Um, how are they interacting with others? What's their core body temperature? What's their heart rate? What's their blood pressure? All of those things are going to be integrated together to allow them to perform self-care. And so I pose to you that space care or Martian health care really is self-care. And I want to point this out. A round trip to Mars is a little over 900 days. Let's just stop and pause and think about that. 900 days in a tin can with three other people that your boss picked out for you to go with. <laughs> and you're not going to have access to burgers or pizzas or all the things that you take for granted. And those Astros games are going to be really late in getting to you. So that round trip to Mars, um, you can't abort if you have an emergency. If you get sick, this could seriously be a very bad day, and you may not come back alive. So what are we solving for? That distance from Earth, 34 million miles away. We can do it. It'll take us seven months to get there. We're going to have to stay on the surface for about a year and a half, and then another seven months to come back. So you do the math, roughly 900 days or so. That distance from Earth also creates another problem. Remember the Apollo mission? Uh, when they landed on the moon, they called mission control. There was maybe a minute delay in communication because the moon actually is fairly close. So if you have a problem and you say, Houston, we have a problem, Houston gets back to you and they have a whole team of engineers solving your problem for you. And they guide you through it like they did on Apollo 13 and save some lives. Well, that distance from Earth means that you're going to have a communication delay of up to 20 minutes each way. So you say, Houston, we have a problem. 20 minutes later, they hear you. And then they figure out what to do. And then 20 minutes after that, you hear their response. So that's 40 minutes delay. And if we're on the other side of the sun from the Earth, which we will be part of this mission, so about two weeks' time, you will have no communication, zero communication with Houston. So you have to know what to do all on your own. So that actually creates a lot of issues for astronauts having to perform health care. The isolation. The isolation, think about it, tin can, three other people, no change in scenery for a very long time, no change in seasons, everything's the same. You can't go outside, you can't open a window, you can't be alone. So the isolation is of major concern for behavioral health. And we know that astronauts that go to the International Space Station right now, they pick up the phone, they call home whenever they want. And they say how important that is when they look down in that beautiful scene of the Earth down below, that gorgeous planet, and they know that everybody they love is on that planet, that blue dot right there. And we see those amazing images. Those are really important for people to feel like they're still part of of the civilization of Earth. But when they're so far away from Earth, and they don't know if they're going to be able to complete their mission safely and come back, the isolation can cause a lot of problems. And we're quite worried about it. The hostile environment, what do I mean by this? You got a hole in your spacesuit, you could die. You, you have something, an asteroid that hits your spacecraft, you could die. You have a failure of your, um, uh, your uh, oxygen uh, system, your um, uh, internal um, uh, ability to uh, recycle your water. If your toilet breaks down, that's going to be a major problem. Talk about a hostile environment. <laughs> and finally, radiation. Oh, because it's going to be zero gravity, so your toilet busts and it's zero gravity. So finally, the radiation. Um, we really, uh, you know, most people don't realize this. We cannot protect you from all the radiation that's out in space. Um, there's just no shielding that can do it that we can send up that's, that's um, light enough in weight to protect you. So you're going to be hit by radiation. You're going to be hit by massive, um, uh, uh, very low doses, but massively powerful energetic particles that hit every part of your body. It's going to hit everywhere. And your tissues are very sensitive to it. So we're really not sure how the radiation is going to affect you. Finally, the altered gravity. Why do I mean, what do I mean by altered gravity? Altered gravity means that while you're on the way to Mars, there's going to be zero gravity, complete zero lack of gravity for seven months. On the Mars surface, it'll be approximately a third gravity. 
And as you know, our bodies have gotten used to having complete gravity here on Earth. It's very important for us to have the loading on our bones and muscles and our, and our hearts as well in order to stay healthy. So a lot of the things that we're seeing in space are actually very similar to accelerated aging, where you start to see, unfortunately, as you get older, you start to see heart disease. The lack of gravity and radiation can cause this. Osteoporosis, your bones are not feeling the forces of gravity, and so they start to break down. You see this in postmenopausal women. Although in astronauts, it happens in weeks. In women who are postmenopausal and they're not taking hormones, it could take years to lose bone. Because of the um, turnover of the bone, you start releasing a lot of minerals in your bloodstream, which your kidneys filter, and then you start to see kidney stones. Imagine having a kidney stone on the way to Mars. Cognitive decline, again, because of the radiation, we're worried about the astronauts not being as sharp as they could be or should be. Depression due to the isolation, and then cancer due to the radiation. Not likely to develop during the mission, but after the mission, and we want to bring people back healthy. So, Okay, I'm stuck. Somebody help? Okay. So how are we going to solve these problems? As I mentioned before, we'd like to continuously monitor their health. And this means that whatever we're developing for the space program, we're going to develop for Earth as well. We're going to constantly make sure that what's normal for them stays normal. And we're going to intervene before disease. We will change their diet. We will give them meds. We will make them exercise more. We will, we will change the lighting in the spacecraft so that they can get more sleep. We can vary all kinds of things, including mood music, if they need to relax. And then with knowing the genetics, the family history, and what each astronaut is susceptible to and also responsive to in terms of the medication that works for them or not, we will personalize and simplify the therapies. And all these things can be applied to you here on Earth as well. And that means some new technologies. So let me just give you a few examples. This is a picture of uh, Dr. David Newman, who was the deputy administrator for NASA in the previous administration. She's a faculty member at MIT, and she's developed this suit that actually can uh, keep your muscles working really well, even just walking around, so you don't have to exercise. You've got the suit on. But in addition to that, there's some embedded smart clothing um, uh, uh, devices in this type of suit where, you know, any, anybody here have a Fitbit? I'm sure some of you have worn a Fitbit at some time. You know, it measures your activity. Maybe some of them will measure your heart rate. Some of them will measure your, your blood pressure. Um, they're getting more and more clever these days. There are sweat sensors that could tell you whether you're dehydrated. Uh, there's monitors that you can wear that actually tell you your heart rate, your breathing rate. And in the car of the future, they're going to embed sensors in the seatbelt so that if you're starting to fall asleep and your breathing becomes too regular, the car is going to turn on the radio and pull down your windows so that you wake up. Okay, like seriously, I've seen the technologies. Company called Affectiva, and a lot of the uh, car manufacturers are now integrating this into um, the smart cars of the future. So all of this can be embedded not just in your clothing, but the environment as well. It could be tracking you all the time, know exactly who, who you are, your background, what you're susceptible to, what's good for you, and actually change the environment or give you suggestions and let you know when things are becoming a little bit off from normal for you. So what we're looking at is the brave new world of an artificial intelligence. Just like the last talk, Panas was talking about um, um, facial recognition. This is going to recognize all your biorhythms. It's going to know who you are. And it doesn't need to be just for astronauts. In fact, in your own home, I have a Google device. Other people have Amazon um, devices, as Alexa and others. Unfortunately, those devices are listening to you. And how you walk, for example, if you're an, uh, an older person, it can listen to your gait. And it can tell whether you're susceptible for a fall that day. It can listen to your voice. And it could pick up whether you're starting to develop Parkinson's. This, is, is, this technology exists today. It's being used. This is the brave new world of the future. We're going to be able to integrate all of this information and give you some tools in your hand so that when you're far away on the surface of Mars or you're far away from a major hospital center and you're in East Texas in a tiny town that has 500 people and no doctor, you're going to know when there's a problem and when you need to call for help. So I want to go to one example that I'm going to give you today that 
Without this, uh, for the SPACE program would not have happened and is completely changing how we do kidney stone therapy for Earth. How many people here had a kidney stone? It's kind of dark to see. Not that many, but it's very painful. Very, very painful. And right now, it presents with lower back pain. You have excruciating lower back pain. You're going to go to the emergency room, and they're going to do probably a CT scan or an X-ray, and they say, ooh, you have a kidney stone. If it's small enough and you're lucky, they'll send you home, and they'll say, drink lots of water, here's some pain meds, and hopefully it'll pass on its own. Well, it could take up to six weeks or longer. Sometimes it doesn't pass. So then you have to go to your urologist. A urologist will have to assess where the stone is, and if you're really unlucky, they're going to have to do surgery where they go in through the ureter, and they have to pull it out with a cup under anesthesia, thank God. Or they have to do lithotripsy, which is a massive amount of sound waves, breaking it up like a massive tsunami, which can damage your kidney in order to break up the stone. And if, in fact, you have a stone that's blocking urine flow, this is an emergency surgery right now because this can develop into sepsis and can cause you to die. So what have we done? If you get a kidney stone in space, we're going to have to get it out. And the way we're going to do it, and this was developed with space in mind, is use ultrasound. Anybody here had ultrasound at all? If you were pregnant, you probably had lots of them. If you had a, a, a muscle tear, they might have used therapeutic ultrasound on you. This is a totally revolutionary device. Whoops, sorry. Total revolutionary device, highly, highly miniaturized. So the normal ultrasound machines come on a cart. They cost about $40,000, and you need different probes from different parts of the body. Ultrasound is not just for diagnosis. Ultrasound can generate energy and it could push on those stones. So imagine those stones in your kidney. Ultrasound can image them. Sorry, I keep, keep going backwards. I apologize. Oh, OK, turn it back on. Sorry, guys. Um, it could push on the kidney stones. And if it's um, blocking flow, it'll push it back into the kidney. So if it's not blocking flow, the ultrasound can image it and actually you could put the ultrasound sound waves directly on the stone and push it out of the kidney, into the ureter, into the bladder, and out it goes. And it was done in humans in Seattle for the first time about three years ago. The com company was formed around it, and now they're going to get FDA approval. And the next time you have a kidney stone, you do not have to have surgery. This device will be able to be implemented in the doctor's office. You might even be able to do it yourself. So this ultrasound device is truly re revolutionary. This one does not do the, ultrasound, the kidney stone therapy, but it could very easily, and we're sending this up to the space station. So I hope I've convinced you, giving you just a little tidbit of example. We have dozens and dozens of other examples that Martian healthcare is really, truly a new paradigm for Earth. So this is why I strongly believe in human exploration of space, and particularly deep space, because not only are we going to learn about our universe, and our own planet, we're going to learn about our own health as well. Thank you.